you can open up your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 7, we're going to be uh, tonight, okay? Uh, Mark chapter 7, if you have a Bible or a device, use it. If you don't have a Bible and you'd uh, like to use one here, any of these Bibles, you see out these orange and yellow ones, they're available to you, and you can uh, use those. And the longer passages of Scripture that I'll share with you, the page number that corresponds with those books, those Bibles, will be up on the screen. Um, so you can turn to it. But Mark chapter 7, uh, we're going to be in verse 31 through 37. I'll pray with you real quick, and then we'll jump into um, we'll jump into the Bible. Lord, thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for each person who's here. These are my best and closest and dearest friends. I love them. Um, thank you for, the, um, for their love back to me and my family. Uh, I thank you for the privilege of being able to do this. I understand the weight of it all, but it's still a joy. And so difficult to call it a job sometimes because I love doing what we do and I thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, Lord, thank you for this place that we can come and gather in a comfortable setting. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Think of all the you know, years that have gone by here, all the lives that have passed through here, all the life changes happened here as people heard the word of God over the years since the uh, late 1800s. I can only imagine. I would have loved to have had a video camera going here the whole time. Although they didn't have it back then, but that's a good idea. Uh, wish they had come up with them. Would have loved to see all the people um, accepting Christ. Would have loved to see the people getting baptized. Just all the life change would have been amazing. Uh, but I thank you for everyone that's here today. Uh, I know more that um, not everybody in this room probably is a Christian, and it's uh, it's a it's a tough message. And, and so Lord, I, you know you're going to need to do some work here today in us. Uh, even those of us that call ourselves Christians, it may it may be tough to swallow. And so you're going to need to do some work here with us. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would break down the walls uh, that are stubborn, that will not allow, allow change. Uh, uh, you know, we just need you to do your work. So we invite you to do that. And uh, I guess that's about it, Lord. Thank you for uh, letting us gather. Blessings on our time here today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Um, I'll take you back a ways. Um, somewhere around 98, 99, uh, I wasn't a Christian before then. Uh, I am now, but <laughs> that's a good thing, right? I'm up here. I think it's a prerequisite for working here. Um, <laughs> so, so I didn't, I didn't like. I knew God. I, I knew of God, right? Like I knew of God. I grew up um, Jewish. Went to the temple, you know, and. Got bar mitzvah, kept the kosher. I'm very familiar with the traditions of the Jewish faith. Like I, I celebrated Hanukkah because it's good because you get presents, right? And, and I celebrate some other holidays because my parents made me. Anyone familiar with that concept, right? You know nothing about God, but you know of Him, right? So I knew of God, but I didn't know about Him. And so um, when I started to wonder uh, about Him. You know, he really started to reveal himself to me. And what I did is I, I went to the source. I went to the greatest source known to man, and it's, and it's this book. And so I started reading, and I still have my original Bible. I started reading this book so that I could, I could move from knowing of him. Like, I knew that there was some kind of a God up there that gave me some sense of, of moral values and some right and wrong. Like, I knew some things were really wrong and some things were okay. And where did I get that? Well, I knew of God, but I didn't know about him much. And so when I, I wanted to, to, to know about him, I went to the source of him. Like, this is his book. He chose to write this book so that we would know about him. And what happens is you start to read this book, faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so when you hear the word of God, even if it's spoken out of your own mouth, your faith in him begins to grow. Your trust, your dependency, your, your, your confidence in him begins to grow. So it transferred, it goes from, from knowing uh, of him to really knowing about him. And as I learn about him, I can begin to trust in him. Does that make any sense? Okay, so many of you have been on that same journey uh, for a long, long time, and I want that to continue tonight. Now, so what, what we're going to do to continue that, we... we we actually started to, to, to continue that several months ago. We started this message series, Absolute Authority, right? Because we wanted to see the miracles of Jesus so we could know about him, so we could decide whether we want to trust in him, right? That's what we did. And I want to continue to do that right now. Now, while you're there in Mark chapter 
7, I'm going to read something to you out of Matthew chapter 15. The reason why I do this, I told you I was going to go through Matthew and I would go through each and every miracle. And as we got to it, we would, we would, we would park in that. And we, would, we would unpack that miracle and, and learn things from it. I wouldn't dodge and skip. But sometimes there's a miracle in one of the Gospels that's also in one of, if not two more, of the other Gospels. And I'd go to the one that I felt was the, the most appropriate for us. But I don't want to blow by Matthew's account that was written to mostly Jewish people before we read Mark's account that was written to mostly uh, Gentiles in the Roman Empire. Uh, Matthew's account is this. It's, it's actually... In, in verse 29, and then it goes just for a couple of verses. And I'll, I'll read it to you. Just listen in. This is written to the Jewish folks. It says, Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. I thought that was kind of peculiar. There's no value. I just thought I'd mention that. I thought it was cool that, he, that they included in that. Sat down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus and healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. The crippled were made well. The lame were walking. The blind could see again. They praised the God of Israel. So there's a Jewish plug in there. And that's who Matthew is writing to. But I don't want to blow by that because it's like a summary of all that's happened. He's just, he's healing everything. Like nothing is too much for Jesus to do. And I want you to understand that. I have your brain around that before we jump into the Mark account. Now the Mark account is written, like I said, to Gentiles. It's a little bit different, but the thing that's really different about it is that Mark does not spend a whole lot of time talking about the variety of different healings. It seems as though when we read this, you're going to see that he spends a lot of time talking about one of this vast crowd. And he, and he, and he, and he focuses a lot of attention on this one thing. Now, most of the time when you read a miracle in here, at the bottom in these translations we have now, at the bottom of the miracle, it'll have another uh, reference. Like at the end of the Matthew, it says Mark. And so what it's telling us is that the similar story is found in that other gospel. You can go check that out too. Now when I read this to you, you're going to probably think like I did, maybe. This doesn't sound anything like the other one. So how can it be? Well, the only thing I can tell you is that if you read the whole thing, like the whole page before and after, you're going to see that the miracle we talked about last week, you know the woman who has the uh, demon-possessed daughter and then Jesus heals her? You remember that one? Okay. That's just before this thing I just read in Matthew. And right after it is the feeding of the 4,000. And when you go to Mark, same thing. Those stories bookend what you're about to hear. So based on what's in the scriptures, based on what happened chronologically, I'm, I'm assuming that the Bible translators and all, they assume that this is the similar account, but different focus, if you will. So if you and I see the same thing, but you're standing over there and I'm standing over here. We see the same thing, but different sides of it, you see? So this is what happens here in the Mark account, seven verses. You guys ready to read it? You there? Anyone alive in here? Yeah. Okay, I'm just checking. Like, I just want to say, like, growth means that when I ask you something, you actually answer. That would be awesome. See, that's energy. That's energy. So if I ask you something, just follow back, okay? Uh, yeah. All right, I love, I love that. Are you all alive in here? Yes. yes. Isn't that, I mean, just for, let's look at the Bible now. It wasn't that more fun? Yes. So just that alone is valuable. Uh, Are you guys alive? Yes. See what I mean? Uh, all right. You ready? Here we go. Jesus left, I read, anyway, <coughs> maybe, went up to Sidon. Tyre is, is, is like the northern part of Israel. So if you look into the map, and northern Israel is up here, and you've got the Sea of Galilee, like to the left and, and up, Tyre. And a little bit further up than that is Sidon. So he leaves this area, he's doing all these miracles day after day after day, all these accounts. They're all in the Sea of Galilee, but he travels this way and up. And then after he goes out there, it says that he comes back to the Sea of Galilee and to the region of the Ten Towns. So here again, if you're looking up here at, the, at this imaginary map of Israel, so here's the Sea of Galilee, and here's Tyre and Sidon. If you look at the bottom left of the Sea of Galilee, that's the region of the Ten Towns. That's all Gentiles for the most part in that area, okay? That's who 
today. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. I want to pause here for a second. You, you, I want you to pick up on some of this. That's why slow scripture reading is valuable. They're not just asking him to heal. They're asking him to do it in their way. That's their choice. Lay your hands on him and heal. Okay, so they're not just asking for the healing. They're asking for their way of healing. That's important. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his... I need a, I, does anyone want to volunteer for a second? No. Oh, come on. You know exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> yeah. And then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. I don't say you. Okay. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said something that I can't pronounce, which means, be opened. Everyone's cool with the be opened part. Like, if Jesus says... Be open, and, and all of a sudden his ears open and you hear. Is everyone cool with that? Yeah. But like the spitting on my fingers and touching your tongue with it, that's nasty, right? That's nasty. Instantly, the you know, the super spiritual people are like, no, man, I, 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 I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. He can spit yeah. on my tongue anytime. What, what's wrong with you guys? We, you just uh, can't spit on your tongue when they beat on your shit. Not with <laughs> Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. I don't know if he had a stutter. I don't know what's going on, but I can speak really plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news, and they were completely amazed and said again and again, quote, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. So, um, I read this to you. Now, the first account, awesome. He heals everything. He heals everybody. That's awesome. So we give props to Jesus for the ability to heal whatever you bring to him. So that's awesome. Like, I can't do that. Like, I know the Bible says something about us being able to do what he does even greater, but I'm not going to spit on your tongue. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to do that. But listen, the, the reason why I wanted to read this, what's the, what's the thing in the second account that stood out the most? I mean, tell me, what's the thing that stands out the most? Huh? Yeah. And spit, right? That's disgusting. Like, that to me is gross. I love Jesus, but that's gross. And, and so now, but I'm, starting, I'm reading that thing, and all of a sudden I start thinking back on all these other miracles that we've, we've studied. And I'm like, man, that's kind of weird. Why, why did he do that? And so I went back to, to the other accounts that we've, that we've read, and I started listing them. And, and let me just bring these to your attention. Maybe you'll remember these things. Uh, in Matthew chapter 8, there's a leper. And Jesus simply touches him and says, be healed. And the guy's healed. Cool, right? That's fine. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, there's this Roman soldier who's got a, a servant who's paralyzed and near death. Right? But if you remember back, Jesus never even went to the dude's house. He kind of threw his voice, if you will. It was across town. He hadn't got to the house yet. And so he looks at the Roman soldier and just simply says this. Because you believed, it has happened. Healed. Matthew chapter 8 also, Peter's mother-in-law, remember? She has a high fever, 103, 104, 105, 106. Don't know what it is. Bible doesn't say. What's up to that? Right? Doesn't say, but, it, but he's, she's got a high fever. And so what, is, what does Jesus do there? He simply touches her, and she's better. Matthew chapter 9 is the paralyzed guy on the mat. The, they, bring, they bring the paralyzed guy to Jesus. They can't get in the house, and so they lower him down through the roof, right? And so what does Jesus say? Now, we know that he said that your sins are forgiven. That was the ultimate task, right? That's what God's trying to do with all of us. More, more so than our physical ailments. But how does Jesus heal his physical ailments? Does anyone remember? Right, I just said that. And thank you for listening. Careful. But she's right, taking notes, A for that, right? A for that, right? What does he say? Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Doesn't touch him, doesn't spit on him, nothing. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Matthew chapter 9, 
There's the woman with internal bleeding, and she presses through the crowd, right? And, she, and he doesn't lay hands on her or nothing. She presses through the crowd, and she dies, and she just touches the fringe of his robe. Instantly, she's healed. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He's just walking along. And she goes through, and she touches not even his body, but his robe. And she's made well. Matthew chapter 9 also is the leader of the synagogue, probably a rabbi. And his daughter dies. She's dead. They're actually singing funeral songs, okay? She's there, dead. It's not like maybe she is dead, okay? And so what happens? He takes her by the hand, and she rises from the dead, okay? Um, Matthew chapter 9 also, there's two blind men. And what does he do? He touches their eyes, and they could see. Matthew chapter 12, there's a dude with a deformed hand. I'm not making light, but here it is, right? There's a deformed hand. And Jesus just simply says this, reach out your hand. What's this? Heal. Didn't touch him. Didn't do anything. Do you see a pattern here? See, you want to see a pattern, don't you? We all want to see a pattern because we want to know how to get it done. Right? He's smiling because he knows it's true. We all want to see a pattern. Do you see a pattern here? You don't see a pattern here because there's no pattern. There is no pattern to what Jesus does. And that loves us wrong because we, want to have, we have this insatiable desire as people to understand stuff because we want to own stuff. We want to control things. We want to know. We have science. We have the internet. We have Almighty Google. Almighty Google. We have sociology and psychology and archaeology and, and theology, the study of God. Why? All, why do we have all these ologies? Because we want to understand stuff. We want to know things. I need to know this. And so I have an ology. What's up? Hey, everybody. We have, this, we have this insatiable desire to know stuff because we want to control stuff, okay? And here's the thing. I'm going to share with you tonight. This is why I said it's, it's kind of tough to hear this, okay? The reason why it's tough to hear what I'm going to share with you is because, like, if you go to Long's Christian Bookstore, you'll, these verses I'm going to share with you, you'll never see them on a coffee cup. You'll never see them on a T-shirt. You won't see them on a bumper sticker, okay? These are not Bible. You know, we, when you go to this bookstore, you see verses like, uh, For God so loved the world, He gave His Son. And all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord because we want things to work out for us, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I'm a superhero. You will never hear what I'm going to share with you tonight. You'll never see those, these on a bumper sticker, because they rub us the wrong way. Okay? Psalm 115.3 says this. You don't have to go there. Just listen. Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens, and he does as he wishes. Amen. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> he does as he wishes. So when you see up, when I start listing all these ways that Jesus did it, he did it the way he wanted to. He doesn't have to fall into your mold. But we want, we want to understand. Like, I pray for, they're both sick. I pray for him, he's healed. I pray for her, she's not. Why? I did it the same way. Same God, same person, same prayer. He's healed, she's not. Why? Have ever thought that way? Well, why is he prosperous and I'm not? I pray. Why does, why does he have a happy marriage and we don't? Why? We both pray. Why is it? Let me tell you why. Because God does as he wishes. And that rubs us against the grain, doesn't it? When things happen, we pray. Which, we're like, I'm a Christian. I yelled at God. I remember when my ex-wife walked out. I'm like, I used every cuss in the book in him. Why did this and this? Why? I'm a pastor. I give, I serve, give my life to you. Why? Because I do as I wish. We gotta get small. You gotta get small. Happily small. Here, here's another one, just in case that one isn't enough. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 35. I want you guys to know about God. So that's 
what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to talk about God. So you're going to understand who He is. You can't, you can't have a good relationship with someone unless you know who they are, right? Like, not what somebody told you. Who He really is. Who He really is. Daniel chapter 4. Under the inspiration of God's Spirit, all of this book was written. But in this section here, this is Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the king of the powerful, very powerful, um, Babylonian Empire. He's the enemy, right? But after a certain sequence of events, he writes this about our God, the God, who he didn't worship before, but now he does. In verse 35, he says, All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. That's humbling, isn't it? That's, that's humbling, isn't it? Like, all of our great, our great athletes, we think, you know, these guys, they, they go down court, they dunk, and they beat their chest, like, look at me. All these great CEOs making millions of dollars, political figures that are powerful. We're nothing. All these great scientists, all these tremendous theologians, all these deans of tremendous centers of learning, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, you're nothing. You're nothing compared to him. And this is coming out of the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most powerful people who's ever lived on the face of the earth, and he's saying none of us compare to him. He does as he pleases. He does what he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. Does that sound familiar? That's our jump off verse for this series. Jesus Christ says, I have been given authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. And I'm sorry about my mic. I don't know what's going on. He does what he, as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Here's the most powerful man on the earth saying, I don't even have the right to question what you do, God. Now let me just sidebar that I think it's healthy to ask God some things. And I think if you open up the book of Psalms, you see David pouring out his heart, asking the tough questions of God. And God's faithful to answer you might not like what he says, but it's okay to ask. But what he's saying here is not so much that you can't even ask, but like, you are nothing. Do you, do you guys know who we're dealing with here? We're talking about Almighty God, the one who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth. First John 3.20 says that God knows everything. He knows everything. Hello? He's working on it. Done. It says that he knows everything. So the great thinkers of the world, scientists, archaeologists, theologians, all this, were nothing <coughs> compared to him. Nothing compared to him. Here's another one. This is absolutely awesome. If you go to Job 26, I don't know that I even put it up on the screen, but I want to invite you to go to Job 26 with me. Job 26, if, there's, uh, if you go, most people know what the Psalms are, maybe. Uh, if you go backwards, two books, on one book, you'll see Job. Go to Job chapter 26. I just want you to get increasingly small. You know, the Bible tells us we're supposed to humble ourselves. Okay, and that's good. We should practice that. But tonight... God wants to humble you. He's doing the work. And as you listen to this, don't resist and fight and think you're all that, okay? Just give in to who we're really talking about here when we gather on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Job chapter 26, starting in verse 7, it says this, God stretches the northern sky over empty space, and he hangs the earth on nothing. Just think about that. Do you, ever, do you ever just stop when you see a picture of the earth gliding? Just sitting there with nothing holding it up? It's just floating on space. Does anyone else get freaked out about that? Do you, like, I didn't know, I don't know the exact number, but can anyone tell me? Do you know how fast we're spinning right now? 900 miles an hour we're spinning right now. And that is just like, you can't even comprehend 
thank God because you don't even know that. We don't even think of who we're dealing with here. You gonna look it up? I think it's faster than I do. It's really stinking fast, right? It's in there. Look it up on Google. We have to understand who we're dealing with here. Okay, listen, God stretches the northern sky over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps the rain in his thick clouds, and the clouds don't burst with the weight. He covers the face of the moon, shrouding it with his clouds. He created the horizon when he separated the waters. He set the boundary between day and night. The foundations of heaven tremble, and they shudder at his rebuke. By his power, the sea grew calm. By his skill, he crushed the great sea monster. He crushed chaos. His spirit made the heavens beautiful. You ever walk out and see those stars? I can imagine what it's like the first time. I can't, I can't remember that when, when the psalmist went out and said, man, like, look, and I see that kingdom. Fathom, why didn't you think of me? Do you ever think that way when you look up there and you see it? It's the same. 900? 700, 900. Mimi got an A for notes, and Mary got an A for no one. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen to this. Um, his spirit made the heavens beautiful, and his power pierced the gliding serpent. But now, this is the part that's awesome. These are just the beginning of all that he does. Some translations will say that creation, the planets, the galaxies, the stars, all that we just don't even know about in this infinite universe, that they're just the fringes of his work. Merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? I like to put things into numbers so I can try to wrap my brain around it. I hope that you appreciate the size of who God is. The known universe, this is just NASA talking, the known universe according to them is about 45 billion light years. Just so you don't know, Light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles a second. Uh, just, just get that number in your head. 186,000 miles. That's a lot of miles, right? That's a lot of miles in a second. Now, I don't know how many seconds are in a year, but would you all agree with me that there's a lot? So if every second contains 186,000 miles, would you say that 45 billion Light years is a lot. Can you even, does it make your brain swell or melt and come pouring out your ears? Okay, that's the known, this is scientists talking, okay? We don't even know. That's just, that's just their guess. That they believe it's about 45 billion light years. But yet the Hubble telescope, which is our greatest tool to see off into the universe, it has only seen 13 billion light years. The known universe is 46 billion light years. Each year has a lot of seconds, and each second has 186,000 miles in it. And yet, this thought that blows our brain is but the fringes of his work. A mere whisper of his power. The universe is mine, says the Lord. And the Lord says that this Jesus is my son, and you should listen to him. And this son said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to this unseen God except through me. Amen. You get another point right there. <laughs> I find it. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you how this is going to get done because it's the only way to get there. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be treated unfairly. And I'm going to be whipped. And I'm going to be beaten. And I'm going to be slapped, spit on, pierced, stretched. I'm going to die in the three days. I'm going to rise from the grave. 
And Peter, who's been hanging out with him the whole time, says, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. This will never happen to you. And Jesus says, you're using human thinking. And that's what we do. See, everybody has a mold that they want to try to put God in. Every single person in this room has a mold. That's, it's, just, and it's not that it's evil. It's just what it is. We all have preconceived notions of who God is and who he should be. Like we're going to tell him what to do, right? Yeah, I know you made you for but let me tell you how you should do this. Do this, right? We do it all the time. Peter had that. He had a mold. No, no, Jesus. Like, I love you. Yeah, you're God and everything, but that's not the way it's going to work. He's like, no, get away from me, Satan. <laughs> no, it is going down this way. This is the way it's going to be. And we all have a mold like that. Like, if I was going to write my own religion, my own thing, I wouldn't have written it like that. It would have probably represented, like, it would have probably looked more like the movie Thor. Right? Good looking dude. Beefcake, right? Just jacked. He's got the big hammer. Superhero, you know what I'm saying? That's what I, I wouldn't have done some like, the, the Bible says he was nothing to look at. So like some skinny, ugly dude who goes to a cross and dies. Like that wouldn't have been the, that wouldn't have way, I wouldn't have written that. That's not really going to fly, right? And Peter was the same way. Now that's not the way it's going to fly. I have my own idea as to how this should all happen. And we're all like that. Jesus, not only should it happen this way, but, but, but when you bless me, I want to be like these guys in that mark account. I want you to lay your hands on them and heal them. I want to tell you how you should do it because I'm smart. And you're not so smart, Jesus. Like, I know that you're the creator and everything. I saw you walk on water, but can I just tell you how you should do this? I got a great idea. And I want to tell you, I want to help you out with this whole universe thing. Somehow this God that can direct lightning bolts, according to the book of Job, direct lightning bolts to exact locations. This, this God that, that determines which field gets rain and which one doesn't. Somehow this creator who can do these amazing things. But, but, like I know you created everything, but Genesis one, one. In the beginning, God created history, theology. History. Something was made. Theology. God did it. Enough said. Right? That should be enough for us to give in to his way. When he determines how it's going to happen. Instead of telling him what to do. So somehow we choose to figure out how we're going to do this. I guess the most popular way that this is all going to go down is that I'm going to be we're going to be good. If we're good, we're going to get in. Like, there's this, this stone called atheist out there that does not believe in God, doesn't believe in heaven, doesn't believe in hell, don't believe in nothing. They just want to know where they're going to get their next six pack. That's fine. That's it. But most people would agree they just want to go to heaven. Because they don't see it, they don't know what it is, but they want to go there. They have no clue, but they want to go to a good place. And unfortunately for most people, it's, it's an earning thing. It's a performance-based thing. Religion, And if I'm good enough, I'll get in. My mom's that way. I guess we should pray for her. She's steeped in the Jewish religion. She feels like if she's good enough, she'll get in. I'm kind of a jerk, like a digger. You know, I give her a little dig. Man, what if you just come on one shoe? That would suck. <laughs> You know I don't have a filter. But wouldn't it suck? What if, it, what if that was the case? What if it was performance based? Listen, nowhere in that book does it tell you like how many good things you've got to do. I don't want to serve a God like that. I don't, want to, I don't want to serve a God that keeps me hanging. I don't need any cliffhangers. I don't want to, I don't have to worry about I don't want to, have to keep a journal of how many nice things I did for you guys so that I can get in. That's just not the way that it works. But God decides. Do you know in Joshua chapter 10? This is insane. In Joshua chapter 10, there's a story of, of Joshua leading the, the people of Israel, and they're fighting the Amorites. Back, like, back then, they didn't have like laser technology and infrared goggles, and you press a button in Virginia, and you bomb someone in Siberia, and the, and the bomb lands on a mat behind with perfect radar. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's what we do now. See, back then, you'd go out during the day because you could see. You'd grab a sword or a spear, and you'd start fighting with each other. And whoever is still alive, they win. That's the way they fought wars, right? Woo. They didn't go out at night because you couldn't see. Like, there might be some sneak attacks. But generally speaking, you literally, you've seen the movies, you'd go into a field, charge up! And you'd go down there and you'd go like crazy, and you start slicing and dicing and killing people, right? So, so what happens is, in Joshua chapter 10, so that they can defeat the enemy, like to be done with it, he stops the earth's rotation. Do you guys get this? The sun stood still, and it never set that day. We know now that it's not the sun that's spinning around us, it's us. So he stopped the earth's rotation so they can win. Do you guys know what we're dealing with here? Flippant attitude and approach to your faith. This is the God who stopped the earth's rotation. But yet, we still want to tell him what to do. And we want to put him in a box. He spoke to the darkness and it was light. He spoke to the storm and it stopped. He does as he wishes. That is God. And I need you to know this because I want you to know him. Not know of him. I want you to know him. I want you to be intimate with him. I want you to understand who you're dealing with here. The importance of understanding who he really is, so you know how to interact with him. Okay? That's why we do this. So the, I want to get to the nitty-gritty of why we're of, of, of tonight. Okay? This is this is why we're here. We, we see that he heals people in different ways, right? And, and he does it as he wishes. So here, here's the nitty-gritty of it all. Psalm 115, last week, and I shared with you. It, it tells us who can worship him. Who can stand in his presence. And, and do you remember what it says? It, said, it, said, it says this, that the blameless can. The blameless can stand before him and worship him. Who's blameless? No one. No one is blameless. Every single person, including myself, we've all done at least So therefore, because you've done something wrong, it doesn't matter how many good things you've done. If you've done something wrong, you are not blameless anymore. The reason why I want you to understand this is because we need to know who God is. We need to know who God is. And God says that this is the way it's going to work. Only the blameless can worship me. Only the blameless can stand before me. And all of us. Every single person that can believe. But yet, because he loves you, he sends his son to pay the price. He sends his sinless, perfect Savior Son to take your place, to take your strength. Here we do a verse, Colossians chapter 1, and we'll go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, 22. It tells us this. This is light as you want to say it is. It's a churchy word, isn't it? Run around. It says that you were God's enemy, separated from him. That's unsaved. Unsaved means you exist, but you have no connection. His enemy. And if we think it's because of the things that we do that get us there, that's not true. But I'll tell you what, it's the things that we think and the things that we do that get us separated. It says right here that you were his enemy due to your thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you back to himself. Say, that's it. 
So it's very, very, see, a lot of people would say, well, what does it mean to be saved? And there it is. In that, so now you know. And one time, because of your thoughts and actions, because they were evil, because they were wrong, they were selfish, they were greedy, they were mean. Because of those thoughts and actions, you were separated from God. Yet if you've said yes to Christ, there's good news for you. It says even though you have these, these nasty thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself, brought you back. That's reconciled us. Put you back into proper relationship with him through the death of Christ in his physical body. Now, as a result of this, he, Jesus, brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Now, there's something very, very important in those words. And we're going to dive into this a little bit more next week at Easter. But everything, he says, listen to this. As a result, he has brought you into his presence. You are holy. You are blameless. And, and you are without single fault as you stand before him. It's all in the present tense. See, a lot of people live like, here we are now, I'm just doing the best I can now, but someday I'm going to be in the presence of God in heaven and all things will be better then. But what the Bible really says, that's not true. What the Bible says is when you said yes and you bowed the knee to Jesus because of what he did on the cross, he has brought you right now, right here, right now. Right here in this building, as you sit, Jesus, right here, right now. And as you are standing before him now, you are blameless without a single fault. That's a reason to celebrate. That's a reason to celebrate. Somehow, American culture kind of twists this. I mean, that's good news, right? You don't have to earn it. But the American culture kind of twists this because you, what's happened is, is Christianity became like um, the normal way that certain people act. Like Christians act a certain way, behave a certain way. And what's happened is, is that for lack of a better term, you can plug in your own term here, but jerks can't be Christians. You can change jerks for whatever you want. Let's keep it clean, okay? But there's some, there's some ramifications here. I want you to think about this for a moment. The reason why that's very, very twisted is because some people feel as though because of their thoughts and actually because they've been so yuck that somehow they can't get in and that somehow God would not forgive them of the things that they've done. So let me bring you back for a moment to the, to the DNA of this church that was built off of a, of a verse of scripture that said something along the lines of scumbags welcome. Where it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter what you've done, that if you embrace Christ as Lord and Savior, He'd forgive you of your sin and you would have a relationship with Him. I got the blessing of sharing that, those words with 250 million people worldwide, and I share those words with you tonight. That's good news. And see, when we think that we can't get in because of what we've done, then we don't know God. We don't know God. And you need to know God. That it doesn't make any difference what you have said or done or thought. If you embrace him as Lord and Savior of your life, his death on the cross is what reconciles you back to this unseen God. And you can have a relationship starting right then and there forever with him. The, the, the other thing is that we need to understand is that sometimes we impose those, those, those false values on us. Those false standards on ourselves. But oftentimes we, we impose them on other people. Like, well, you know, I'm a Christian, and somehow I was forgiven. Like the guys last week that we read about, send her away. I, thanks for saving me. But she's begging and bothering us. So send her away, that Gentile. She's not deserving somehow of your, of your love and forgiveness. And so we're like that too, and I just don't want our church to ever be that way. I want us to all understand that it doesn't make any difference what the other person has done or said. It doesn't make any difference how much time they spent in prison. It doesn't make any difference how many drugs they sold, how much beer they drank, how many people they had sex with, how many times they got into fights. It doesn't matter how rotten and terrible they are. Those things are not the thing. They're not the prerequisites that need to not be there to be in the, in the kingdom of God. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and his work on the cross, and that's all you need to do. And so, see, that rubs us wrong, too, because it ticks us off when someone who's nasty and old and did terrible things, and on their deathbed, they genuinely say yes to Jesus, and he lets them into the kingdom, and you get mad because I've been good all my life, and I deserve it because I went to Sunday school, and I give every week, and that no good, you know what, beep, 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 he gets in, no way. That's common thinking. I don't know if it's your thinking, but you know that's common thinking, isn't it? 
Why does he get it? Because God does as he wishes. And you've got nothing to say about who can dare ask him and question his ways. It's his ways. And that's what he does. That's what he does. So the question is, for you, are you a Christian? Don't, don't go by here. Let me, let me clarify. Are you a Christian? Is your entire eternal relationship with the living God based solely on the work of Jesus on the cross? Okay? That's a Christian. That your relationship with God forever is based solely on the cross of Jesus Christ. Not based on what you do. Out of loving response to his work on the cross, we ought to do good. Amen? Y'all didn't say anything. Right? That's the kind of church we need to be. But that's not what gets you into proper relationship with this unseen God. This is not what promises eternity in heaven with the Lord. It's based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Easter's next week. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection. You can't really celebrate Jesus' resurrection if you're not a Christian. I mean, it's like, it's cool. But if you're not a Christian, like, who cares? There's some people in this room right now that I don't know. I'm going to try not to look at you because I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. But we're a mere church. So most churches build up to a crescendo and the piano starts playing and the choir starts singing, the bells start ringing and we're going to come to the Lord. No, not here. Woo! Unashamed. God's the one who created the heavens and the earth. God's the one who decides where lightning bolts go. He's the one who decides the border of the ocean. He's the one who decides the tsunamis. He's the one who decides the hurricanes, the tornadoes. He's the one who decides what field gets the rain and what doesn't. He's the one who decides who prospers and who doesn't. He's the one who heals, and some people do not get healed because he's got a greater plan for them, and you just didn't even know it. He's the one who knew that there was a path through the Red Sea, and the people didn't know about it the whole time it was there. He's the one who stopped the earth's rotation so that Israelites could win. He stopped the earth's rotation. He's the one who spoke into darkness and there was light. He's the one who spoke to the storm and it stopped. He's the one who prayed over the bread and the fish and, and fed 5,000 people plus. He's the one who walked on water. He's the one who raised himself from the dead. He does as he wishes. And there's no other way. And so I unashamedly ask, if I don't know you and I don't know that you're saved, please give in. Give in now. Because he does what he wishes in your plan. If it's not that, it's wrong. I'm just going to tell you, I'm completely closed-minded. I'm a Bible-believing, Christ-following, Jesus freak, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. And if you've not said yes and bowed your knee to him, you are not going to spend eternity with him. You'll be separated from him forever. And it's going to suck. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't say yes, you're done. So I'm unashamed. I'm asking you, if you want to say yes, just say yes, and it's as simple as just acknowledging Jesus Christ as the Son of God who went to the cross to pay for your sin. Jesus, what you did, use it to forgive me before your Father. That's all you got to do. A simple prayer like that, and you're done. I want to know about it before you leave, if that's, the, if, the, if that's the decision you've made. But let me tell you something. He's God. He's God. And, and he does as he wishes, and that is the plan that he's laid out before you. We all deserve death and hell, but thank God he even gave us away, right? None of us deserve it. We're all filthy rotten scoundrels. None of us deserve glory and beauty in heaven. But he gives it to us. He gave us a way. And he let us know that way, which was really nice. Didn't leave us hanging, right? That was awesome. So accept it. Please, I beg you. Easter's big, right? Easter's absolutely, absolutely the biggest time of the year for Christians. That's when people that don't even think about God, that's when they start thinking about God. They start thinking about Jesus, you know. He gets onto the radar map just a little bit. For everybody, it seems. And it, the resurrection is huge, right? We, the Bible says that we have the same spirit living in us that raised Christ from the dead. I, I, I know, again, let me just say that some people in this room are probably going to say, well, he's 
said that you'll do the greater things than me and greater than that. And I'm just going to say right now, I'm probably not going to be able to raise people from the dead. You know, it's just like, not, probably, probably not, I'm not going to do it. I know I can't do that. And I know I can't raise myself from the dead. Like, that's probably Jesus' thing. I think that's cool. I'd love to. That'd be cool. That'd be way cool. It would kind of change your perspective in life, wouldn't it? If you knew, like, if I die, I'll just go and raise from the dead. It would change the way you did things, wouldn't it? But I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. It's big. It's big. It's big. But that's kind of reserved for Jesus. But here's the thing. Sorry for the score. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says this. If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Easter is huge. It's kind of huge for me because, like, this is what I do for a living. Y'all pay me to do this. Like, this is what I do. If, if there's no sense in it, that would be kind of stupid. Like, what am I even doing here? Why are you even all here? And why am I spending all week studying this foolish book if Christ didn't raise from the dead? Good news. Good news, right? Historically speaking, outside of the Bible, we know that he did. So, whew, pressure's off. We know that he did, okay? We know that he did. Christ has to live. Christ has to live because hope in a God that dies is going to make you lower your head. Kind of what he's talking about. And like, if you could die, why would you put hope in him? That's why I'm saying Thor. <laughs> Thor would be better. But, but, but it, so Jesus has to live to make it worthwhile, to celebrate, to, to, to actually follow him as God. He has to live. Because if something, anything, can take him down, then he's not really God, right? You wanna, don't you want to worship something that's strong? Like, I, I want to worship something that's strong. So, 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 like, during Easter, we celebrate God's power, his, his ability to overpower death itself, proving that he's sovereign over the most, uh, the strongest thing that there is in this world, death. So that's awesome, right? Like, I can worship a power like that. I can worship a dude that can say, death, eh, eh, and he rises from the dead on his own, out of the cold tomb, three days. That's really not just kind of dead, that's super dead. And he rises from the grave himself. Like, I can worship a power like that. I really can. It's amazing. But, Easter's important. I don't want to make light of it. I want y'all to be here next week. It's going to be awesome. The kids are going to be doing it. It's going to be a great week. It's going to be an amazing week. But listen, on Easter, we celebrate God's ability. Like he's, I know that the life spirit lives in me, but I can't do this. So we worship and we praise him for his abilities. For his, we, we, we praise his resources, if you will. His ability to do something is incredible. And we, 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 we celebrate that on Easter. But the cross... Christians fight about this too. What's the most important part of Christianity? Well, without the resurrection, without the, this, without that, everyone has their own view of Christianity, what the most important thing is. But at least we celebrate his ability. And his resource. And at the cross, mm -hmm. we celebrate his willingness to use them. To me, that floors me. That floors me. See, how many people in here right now, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people in here right now have enough money in their bank account to write something? You all know who you are, right? How many of you would? That's why I think the cross is awesome. Because we, we understand that he can take lightning bolts and direct them onto that book, right? Or he can hit that cupcake and be careful. He can do whatever he wants, right? He decides that the Earth's rotation stops. But we, we're amazed at his resource, his ability to rise from the dead. That's incredible. So he's an amazing God of endless resource. But at the cross, we celebrate his willingness to die for you. That's, that's insane. That's insane. But I consider myself a pretty nice dude. Y'all are nice. How many people on there, seriously, don't show your hand because you want to be a show off. How many people on there would die for me? How many of you would die? And Corey's like, eh, eh. Eh, eh. Maybe make him some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I like those cookies. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like we 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 make light of our faith. Like, well, we I don't know about that. Right? We make light of our faith sometimes. Like, it's not that big of a deal. How many people in this room would die for me? 
found it. Jesus. So that's why we need to we need to celebrate the cross. I love Easter. I love the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to celebrate the cross. That's what we need to celebrate. It's an old hymn. We're not a hymn singing church. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify. Maybe we should be in the singing song. The church wants to lie. That's pretty good. Why not? <laughs> Don't get carried away. to respond back to you. I'm going to take a moment. I want to pray with you. I want you to, I want you to just think back. You can close your eyes if you want to. Don't even think about me anymore. Just think about the Lord. Think about the cross. Think about what he's done. Just think of the crazy act of the cross. I think it's healthy to, to, to take a moment or two and think to be condemning yourself to think about some of the just the nasty things you've done. You know, just this week, just today. I want you to know God. And God says that because of your evil thoughts and actions, you're separated from God. Just this week alone, the things that you've said, the things that you've thought, the things that you've done, separate us from him forever. Yet, God showed his great love by sending his son to die for you while you were sinning. To me, that, that just blows me away. Some of you might be thinking, you know, the church to hear something new this week. I want to to be up there screaming and yelling and getting all excited about something that I've never heard. Yeah, but what's, what's better than this? Seriously, what is better than to reflect on the one who made the sun stand still? The one who spoke into the darkness and it was light. The one who created a universe that's 45 billion light years big, yet loves you enough to say that. So you can be, let's, let's, just, let's just say what it is, happy, joyful, hopeful, peaceful, not deserved. come here tonight and just listen and don't do something. It's a failure. 
Just to be honest with you guys, the reason this church exists is to see fruit in your life. So let's take a moment here. I'm going to just go silent. The, the gentleman going to pass out a communion to you. While they're doing that, the music's just soft, playing behind. I want you to think about this. You just keep your eyes closed and just ask God personally. Let's just see if God will show up. And don't be ashamed to write down what comes to mind. Because there's a really good chance that's God trying to tell you something. Even if you're sitting there and all of a sudden you think of a pretzel, write it down. It'll come to you. Take a moment or two while they're handing out communion, and then we'll take it together to just ask God how He, want, he wants you to respond to, to the cross. Thank mm -hmm. you. 